My name is Guido Blumenthal, and I'm the Vice President for Global Re Regulatory Affairs in MSD. And I'm here to provide an introduction to ICH E16 and biomarker qualification. The topics to be covered today are a background, content, and application of ICH E16. Then we'll discuss E16 implementation experience as well as very experience with various regulatory agencies, including the U.S. Food and Drug Administration and the European Medicines Agency. First, background on ICH E16. The ICH guideline on genomic biomarkers, ICH E15, was generated in 2007. Here, definitions of genomic biomarkers, pharmacogenomics, pharmacogenetics, genomic data, and sample coding categories were provided. The ICH E16 process began with the first meeting of the working group in 2008 followed by a document for consultation in 2009, and step four was generated in 2010. Here is the definition of biomarker qualification in ICH E16. Biomarker qualification is a conclusion that, within the stated context of use, the results of assessment with a biomarker can be relied upon to adequately reflect a biological process, response, or event, and support use of the biomarker during drug or biotechnology product development, ranging from discovery through post-approval. The objectives of ICH E16 were as follows. To create a harmonized recommended structure for biomarker qualification applications that will foster consistency of applications across regions and facilitate discussions with and among regulatory authorities. To reduce the burden on sponsors as a harmonized format will be recommended for use across all ICH regulatory regions and to facilitate incorporation of biomarker data into specific product related applications. The scope of ICH E16 is as follows. The stru context, structure, and format of qualification submissions include clinical and non-clinical genomic biomarkers, as well as a development of drug or bi biotechnology products, translational medicine approaches, pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, efficacy, and safety. In general, the principles laid out in ICHE 16 include specifying a context of use. This corresponds to the data supporting qualification. It's clearly detailed in the submission package. and It should be specific uh, to the use of the biomarker in product development. The context of use can be either narrow or broad. As far as the structure, of a qualification process. <clears throat> These should be consistent regardless of the context proposed. They should be flexible enough to deal with specific attributes of each submission, and they should facilitate submission and review of future biomarker qualification submission packages, expanding the use of biomarkers to new contexts. As far as the format of biomarker qualification, this varies significantly depending on the context. It should support an evaluation of data and can include reports, tabulations, and raw data. It should be consistent with the methodology and platform used for analyzing the biomarker in question. And there should be reference to standards and or accepting methods uh, could be described as a applicable. Next, we'll talk about ICH E16 implementation experience, as well as experience with various regulatory agencies. On this slide, we list uh, the, all of the qualified biomarkers by the FDA. 
<clears throat> this includes the first qualified biomarker in 2008 by the Predictive Safety and Testing co uh, Consort, which looked at urinary nephrotoxicity biomarkers assessed by immunoassay. These included albumin, beta-2, microglobulin, clusterin, cystatin C, KIM-1, total protein, trifoil factor 3. These are safety biomarkers to be used with traditional indicators to indicate renal injury in rat. In 2010, the International Life Sciences Institute, HESI, and the Nephrotoxicity Working Group uh, qualified clusterin renal papillary antigen also as urinary nephrotoxicity biomarkers as assessed by immunoassay. Again, these were safety biomarkers <clears throat> to be used with traditional indicators to indicate renal injury in rats. O'Brien et al. in 2012 qualified cardiac troponins T and I in the serum and plasma as biomarkers by immunoassay. These, the context of use here was as a safety biomarker to indicate cardiotoxicity in rats, dogs, or monkeys when testing known cardiac toxic drugs to estimate non-toxic human dose. In 2015, the mycosis study group qualified galactomannan uh, by uh, serum bronchoalveolar lavage fluid by immunoassay. The context of use was as a diagnostic biomarker used with other clinical and host factors to identify patients with invasive aspergillosis. In 2016, the COPD consortium qualified fibrinogen by, uh, in the plasma by immunoassay as a prognostic biomarker used with other characteristics to enrich for COPD exacerbation. 2016 saw the Polycystic Kidney Disease Consortium qualify total kidney volume as assessed by MRI, CT, and ultrasound as a prognostic biomarker with patient age and baseline glomerular filtration rate for autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. In 2018, the Critical Path Institute and the Foundation for the uh, National Institutes of Health qualified clusterin, cystatin C, KIM-1, <coughs> NAG, NGAL, and osteopontin as urinary nephrotoxicity biomarker panel by immunoassay. And again, these were uh, safety biomarkers to aid in detection of kidney tubular injury but this time in phase one trials in healthy volunteers. And finally, and most recently, the University of Washington in 2018 qualified Plasmodium 18S RNA or DNA in the blood by nucleic acid amplification. The context of use was as a monitoring biomarker to inform the initiation of treatment with antimalarials following controlled human malarial infection with P. falciparum sporozytes in healthy volunteers for vaccine and or drug development. The European Medicines Agency has also issued a number of opinions and letters of support on the qualification of novel methodologies for medicine development. These include for multiple sclerosis, a clinical outcome assessment, stride velocity as a secondary endpoint in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, uh, measured by a valid and suitable wearable device, molecular imaging of the dopamine transporter as a biomarker to identify patients with early manifest Parkinsonism and Parkinson's disease, plasma fibrinogen as a prognostic biomarker for all-cause mortality and COPD exacerbations, pediatric ulcerative colitis activity index, ingestible sensor system for medication adherence as a biomarker for measuring adherence to medication and clinical trials, and total kidney volume as a prognostic biomarker for use in clinical trials evaluation of patients with autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. 
Drilling down a bit more, uh, specifically focusing on the FDA, these are the key centers at the FDA for biomarker development. The Center for Devices and Radiologic Health does a lion's share of in vitro diagnostic review and approval. They approve the companion diagnostics, complementary diagnostics, uh, the pre-marketing authorizations, and the 510K submissions. The Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, or CEDAR, uh, houses the biomarker qualification process. The Center for Biologics Research, or CBER, does review some PMAs or 510Ks related to CBER blood products. And the Oncology Center of Excellence has a precision oncology program, which helps to guide uh, the development of uh, biomarkers in precision oncology. With the 2016 21st Century Cures Act, the concept of a drug development tool qualification is introduced to encompass both biomarkers and clinical assessment outcome assessments, or COAs. Drug development tools, or DDTs, uh, can be integrated into drug development through three main uh, pathways. One is through the drug approval process or through the normal IND process. The second through uh, scientific community consensus. And finally, the biomarker or DDT qualification programs. So the IND pro pathway is based on, upon agreement with the clinical division at the FDA in the context in the context of a specific drug development program. This is typically negotiated between the sponsor and the FDA in the IND pathway. It's typically a uh, less transparent means of biomarker development uh, because uh, the deliberations between FDA and the sponsor are protected. The scientific community consensus pathway are for broadly and widely used drug development tools. These require appropriate scientific support and are generally ex accepted by experts in the field through emerging data uh, uh, over many years. And finally, what we're discussing today are biomarker or drug development tool qualification programs. This is based on review and acceptance based upon appropriate submission qualification packages available for use in any development program within an approved context of use. So here are the steps for the biomarker or DDT qualification. First, a letter of intent is submitted. This initiates the qualification process of a biomarker for proposed context of use in drug development. Next, a qualification plan is generated. This defines the intended development to generate the necessary supportive data to qualify the biomarker for the proposed context of use. Next comes a full qualification package. This contains all accumulated data to support the qualification of the biomarker for the proposed context of use. Finally, there's a qualification recommendation. This contains FDA's determination on whether the biomarker is qualified for the proposed context of use based on a comprehensive review of the full qualification package. The 2018 FDA guidance lays out the evidentiary framework for biomarker qualification. First, there, there is a needs assessment. This surveys the unmet drug development and medical needs that may be addressed with proposed biomarker. Next, there's a context of use. This includes the biomarker category and the proposed use in drug development. Next, the benefits and the risks are laid out. A benefit is both looked at uh, from a drug development societal perspective and from the individual patient perspective. Benefits look at the potential added value to drug development. This includes 
improve clinical trial efficiency, improve subject safety, improve sensitivity, or improve specificity of the biomarker. Risks include the anticipated consequences if the biomarker is unsuitable for its intended use. Example is a, a faulty biomarker could lead to an underpowered trial or an inappropriate drug development or approval decision. The needs assessment, the context of use, the benefits and risks informs the type and level of evidence needed to support qualification. The evidence to support biomarker qualifications include the biologic rationale, the data supporting the relationship between the biomarker and the clinical outcome of interest, as well as the analytic performance. Before I conclude, I wanted to call your attention to the BEST criteria and resource. BEST stands for biomarkers, endpoints, and other tools. This is a glossary of terminology and uses of biomarkers and endpoints in basic biomedical research, medical product development, and clinical care. This was created by the NIH FDA Biomarker Working Group and is publicly available at the NCBI website. The best resource defines biomarker classes from a drug development perspective. This includes susceptible, susceptibility and risk biomarkers, which indicates potential for developing the disease or medical condition in an individual who does not currently have clinically apparent disease or a medical disease, condition. This includes BRCA mutations for the susceptibility or risk for the development of breast cancer. A diagnostic biomarker detects or confirms the presence of disease or condition of interest or to identify individuals with a subset of the disease. This includes hemoglobin A1c to aid in diabetes diagnosis. Monitoring biomarkers assesses the status through serial measurement of a disease or medical condition, including disease, degree or extent of disease. This would include the International Normalized Ratio, or INR, and anticoagulation status. A prognostic biomarker identifies the likelihood of a clinical event, disease recurrence, or progression in patients who have the disease or medical condition of interest in the absence of a therapeutic intervention. For example, BRCA mutations are prognostic for breast cancer recurrence for patients who are diagnosed with breast cancer. Predictive biomarkers identify patients who are more likely to experience a favorable or unfavorable effect from a specific treatment. This would include EGFR mutations in non-small cell lung cancer and response to EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitors like erlotinib, gefitinib, or osimertinib. Pharmacodynamic or response biomarkers indicate that a biologic response has occurred in a patient who has received a therapeutic intervention. And these may become clinical trial endpoints and possibly surrogate endpoints. An example of a pharmacodynamic or response endpoint or biomarker includes sweat chloride and response to CFTR agents in cystic fibrosis. Finally, a safety biomarker indicates likelihood, presence, or extent of toxicity to a therapeutic intervention when measured before or after that intervention. An example of this is QTC prolongation and torsade de plant. So with that, I conclude my talk, and I thank you very much for your attention.